around again and uh, and of course they stand a little bit for our new worries um, about this new um, uh, mutation um, of the corona virus that came out and i think um, we are all worried and one of the reasons we have our uh, guests with us today is also because we are talking about a book uh, Teresa uh, Smalek wrote about a significant important and consequential New York performer Ron Border um, who in the time you know the uh, AIDS crisis in terrible conditions with his group and also he himself created great work great theater and responding to yes uh, um, in a way um, a virus. So welcome, um, everybody. Welcome, John, and welcome, Teresa. And also, here Marianne. we also have Marianne with us, who just brought her son to school or picked him up. <laughs> daughter, daughter. Um, <laughs> and the daughter, Jesus, yes. Um, um, and um, My and daughter, so, Jesus. Yes. And um, so, so where are you all, John? Um, where are you? Uh, I'm, in the, I'm in New York. You're just back from Italy, right? At the Bellagio. I'm just back from Italy, and I'm in New York. I'm, you know, uh, yeah, the, yeah. The foundation that also played a life, you know, uh, played a role in the Ron's life at the end of his uh, uh, career. Teresa, you are somewhere in our part of us, right? At a CUNY college, some. Yes, I'm in the Bronx. Um, I'm in a classroom here. Which college is it? A Bronx Community College of the City University of New York. So. Well, where, where you you teach in Marianne, you are. Hi guys, I'm in San Francisco. Wow. wow. So oh it's, it's also early for you, right? <sighs> yes, it's been a mad dash, but here we it's, are. Here Thanks. we are, yes. Uh, uh, Thea from Halron, who is with us, also is based in Los Angeles, and she has to you know, start with us working before nine o'clock, which is an unholy time um, for everybody. But um, um, again, um, let's focus um, on what we are here um, to talk about. It's part of the Siegel Center book series. Um, we decided to talk about books, uh, books that were finished, written and conceived in the time um, of Corona. It's a remarkable uh, a lineup. A lot of women writers also put things together and most of them and all of them were part of our Siegel Talks. So we thought um, so much has been shown, now that much is discussed. Now let's focus on, on books about theater performance and help us understanding our, our field, our life and also the world um, better and to, to create um, some meaning. So a few words about Teresa. Teresa is the author of Ron Border Life in Performance. It came out in 2020, Seagull Books. And uh, she wrote for numerous and many, many magazines, New England Theater Journal, the great PAJ, Journal of Performance and Art, the great TDR, Puppetry International Theater Journal, Theater Survey, Theater Research International, anything you have to do to become a recognized good and great uh, uh, academic. And um, she is um, as they're teaching in the Bronx and is teaching theater um, to, to students. And she is curates a literary section for an online journal, The TypeScript. And her interests are theater and performance studies, media studies, gender and politics. And she holds an MA in English from the University of Western Ontario and a PhD in performance studies from NYU with Richard Schachner, who we also will talk about, who kind of guided her also um, in the, uh, the book project and where he was also looking at his own work and own life. I can only imagine how these uh, conversations must have been. Um, then we have John Jesseron, who was uh, from 79 to 82, the assistant of the Dick Cavett show on PBS which is a big claim to fame um, in the world. And not everybody uh, knows that. And he, uh, of course, also interviewed uh, really uh, significant people. They have learned a lot. He always said that at that time, somehow uh, the television, writing, speaking, organizing, scheduling, that informed also his work later on in theater. He did over 40 pieces uh, uh, for the theater, but he is very much known for the 66 episode Chang in a Void Moon, which got the Bessie Award, a fantastic, brilliant, I think, um, series that reacted onto the world of television, the visual, but also the reality, the idea of reality that seemed to infiltrate uh, our world in theater, but with imagination and fictional setting, actually, and not in um, reproduction um, of it. He got very significant uh, awards for his work, which also includes Deep Sleet, 
Deep Sleep. We've got the Obi Award, White Water, Black Maria, Shatterhand Massacre, I would say is a great uh, play too. And his uh, uh, fellowships include the Rome Prize, Rockefeller, Guggenheim Foundation, Asian Cultural Council Foundation, the MacArthur Fellow, all what all of us really would love to get, but we never do, but uh, he, he did it. And um, his projects include Faust, How I Rose at BAM, also was Mar he collaborated with Marianne and many, many other things. And why we talk to him is also because of his thought on Philoctetus, and the Philoctetus variations with, with Ron Water and uh, much, much more, of course, will be done. And his um, Philoctetus actually will be presented in 2002, next February in Mexico City by the great director Martin Acosta in Mexico, where he has a real following um, of his work. And you can see on La Mama's website, his um, Chang episodes. Marianne Weems also is part of the fabric um, of the uh, New York theater, downtown scene for all of our listeners around the world. Um, the, uh, she is a theater and opera director, and she created and founded the award-winning New York-based theater company, The Builders Organization. Anybody who looks at experimental uh, uh, work um, of the last decades in contemporary, you will know the Builders Association, an influential ensemble that had created a significant body of work at the forefront of integrating media and live uh, performance. And I think this is also what unites both John and, and Marianne. And um, she has created over 17 original large scale productions, which is a lot, worked with the famous architects, Dilla and Scofidio the National Center for, for Supercomputing Applications, the South African, South Asian Arts Collective, um, Motoroti, and so, so much more. She has been basically to every significant, important festival around the world, uh, met lots of museum work also at the Whitney. And um, she had very many creative roles, but one of them, and this is also why she is here, is she was a dramaturg at the Wooster Group at the very crucial time of the company where she also worked with Ron and was very close to him and actually before he left on his plane I think in Belladio she was the one who talked to him last um, and said had to say goodbye and he died uh, on the uh, flight back but we will come um, to that later she also worked with David Byrne, Susan Sontag and um, V Girls and many many others and at the moment and this is where she is uh, joining us from she's the professor of theater arts at the University of Santa Cruz. And uh, she was the head of graduate directing at Carnegie Mellon University and created an influential program that's called Integrative Design, Arts and Technology. So thank you all for joining me. I think it is important we get a little, um, little insight of what you are really doing. My name is Frank Henschka. I'm the director of the Siegel Center. And um, before we say a little bit about the book, I would like to ask Teresa, read us a, a passage from the book, something you wrote, and uh, and um, then we'll ask you why you or why why you took ten years of your life to create this book. Thank you, Frank. Thank you so much for having me, and uh, thank you, John and Marianne, for uh, coming on to talk with me about the book. Uh, I'm going to read from the introduction, stories of origin which is about, uh, you know, sort of challenging the myth of how Ron Vodder came into experimental theater without any training or background uh, in theater. M uh, many in the theater community know the legend about the disaffected army recruiter who stumbled upon the performance group's environmental production of Sam Shepard's The Tooth of Crime, 1973, at their downtown theater, the Performing Garage. However, scholars have a harder time explaining Vodder's remarkable rise in the experimental theater scene, first at TPG, the performance group, and then with the Wooster Group. Even in the early 1970s, an era in which both non-performers and the non-professional ensemble were valued, it was not every day that someone with no prior exposure to theater went on, went on to become what Ron, sorry, what Ross Wettstein described as the quintessential ensemble performer, the supreme downtown actor, going so far as to canonize Vodder as St. Ron. It was in a 1989 article titled St. Ron. Contrary to the myth, Vodder's metamorphosis from our Army recruiter to avant-garde actor was not inadvertent. 
while a number of critics, perhaps recycling the same misinformation, posit Manhattan as the site of Vader's accidental entry into theater, he actually started acting at Shaker High School in Latham, New York, while still a teenager. In 1967, Vader entered Siena College, a liberal arts college located near Albany in Loudonville, New York. There he joined the student drama club known as the Little Theater. Over the next four years, Vader built his reputation as one of the club's principal actors and directors. He performed in close to a dozen campus productions. As a student director, he oversaw several pioneering initiatives, including an intermedia version of the 1959 Broadway musical Rashomon. Vader's 1970 rendition incorporated a silent film into the live stage performance. The following year, he directed a production of John Herbert's 1967 play, Fortune and Men's Eyes, a controversial prison drama about a young offender's homosexual awakening. By the time he graduated from Siena College in May 1971, Vader had starred in several productions in the region's amateur theaters. He played Edmund in A Long Day's Journey to, Into Night with the Sing Slingerland Community Players and Tom in The Glass Menagerie at the Albany Civic Center. In, 19, in autumn 1971, Vader went on to pursue graduate studies in drama at Stanford University. His time at Stanford was brief. He came home the following year and returned to the campus stage at the State University of New York at Albany, although he did not enroll in a degree program there. At SUNY, SUNY Albany, Vader starred as Jean-Paul Marat in Professor Jark, is it Jarkaburian's? production of Peter Reese's The Persecution and Assassination of Jean Paul Marat as performed by the inmates of Charenton under the direction of the Marquis de Sade, staged in October 1972. Why has this formative period of Vader's career been overlooked? Part of my task is to account for the gaps and omissions that hinder a fuller understanding of his body of work. Wonderful. So Thank you. Wonderful. Really, really thank you. It gives us an, an idea. And he went to a state college, which is great uh, for us. CUNY and SUNY are so connected. And really, he from, if I understand right, from 77 to 91, he played lead roles in almost every Wooster Group production. And he had a, his uh, stage presence and his also interpersonal skills and management. He also, I think, Shackner in the beginning invited him to also run the company. Um, we are foundational um, to that uh, really significant, world famous uh, and influential companies. Many people say they are like three things of uh, what is the postmodern theater is of Bob Wilson, Hannah Muller and the Wooster groups, um, you know, LSD. So this is uh, really what we're talking about is um, the quite the essential of what theater um, is about, was about and, and um, is regarded as significant and important and meaningful. And he was um, such an important part uh, of the of the creation. So, um, Teresa, um, why did you, why do you write about him? Why do you think he's so significant? Well, Richard Schechner has a lot to do with this. Um, when I came to him with a, you know, dissertation topics, I had a lot of trendy topics and he said, no, 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 no. And then I said, well, what about Ron Botter? And he was like, yes, that would make a good dissertation topic. And so part of it was, you know, simply the fact that Richard Schechner, my dissertation advisor at NYU, knew Ron Botter and had worked with him closely. And at, at around the same time that I, you know, there was a, um, a screening of Jill Godmelow's film, Roy Cohn, Jack Smith, I missed the screening, but I went to see it at the Bopes Library, and I was haunted by that show, uh, by the two characters he played, Roy Cohn and Jack Smith. And I thought, what if, you know, I was fascinated by his ability to transform into those, into those men and by his own connection to them, by the fact that he did this while he was, um, while he had 
uh, while well, he had AIDS. And so, you know, I really didn't, I never met him. I didn't know anything about him, but I decided that this was, you know, the topic I could research. Um, I had Schechner to help, help me find the initial people from the performance group, some people from the Wooster group. And, uh, you know, I, the more I dove in, the more I found out about him, uh, mm -hmm. that was contrary to the known legend, the deeper I started digging to find out, you know. Find out about him. Yes, and he's someone who has been perhaps uh, slightly, you know, not at the main light uh, on the stages you know, when it comes to reflecting about um, New York theater, perhaps in a way also as John's work and, um, and also Marion's work. Um, um, even so, everybody in the theater world do, do know about them. And he was a, a quite a fascinating and uh, um, incredible character. He was also Green Beret. He came from a military family and he was a Franciscan uh, in a seminar. He wanted to become a priest in the military and gave it up. He then actually studied English literature and had a degree um, in that. He it was a soldier. He was known to come 17, 18 times to watch performances at the Wooster Group, and nobody knew who this guy was in uniform watching them. It made the company uncomfortable. Um, he um, then somehow morphed into it. He was an actor, but also taking, I think, directions as a soldier, but then also reinventing it, doing his own work. He uh, used to put ashes of Jack Smith, the legendary underground, complicated underground performer, in his makeup uh, for the Philoctetus performances John um, worked on, he was um, a, a great dancer. He, uh, if I understand what, got naked maybe before rehearsals. If that's all true, the bus at every rehearsal, he would just get naked and then undress again, had a had a, a outgoing life um, in um, the next to his work um, and in the theater company. He was a great friend to, to so many talk drugs and, and almost like Moliere who died uh, on stage, I think in a way, Ron Waters' death was so close. He was at last show, he was in the coffin and the Pilocktitis, we will speak about it later, and uh, basically died also um, on stage. Um, uh, uh, John, what comes to your mind when, when you think about Ron? Oh, well, um... Yeah, I don't know. I've been thinking a, a bit about all this. I mean, there's a lot to think about. And um, uh, yes, we're, we're talking about his life as an actor and his life on this world. And I and I knew him during the Worcester Group times and and that's how I had gotten to know him. But um, and then as the 90s started to loom and um, uh, obviously we heard that he, he'd been sick and Etc. But um, I think you know, from the time that he asked me to uh, work on, you know, do Philoctetes for him, um, he was seemed to be somebody on a mission. He knew he wasn't going to be around, and um, uh, so this idea of being an actor and being present all the time, he was seemed to be already preparing for the time when he would not be present, and he might have to be present in a different way. And so I think this play was a, was a way of him uh, continuing uh, his life beyond the grave. It sounds a little bit morbid, but we talked about all those things, you know, what, what, you know, what do we do if you die? Am I, am I, do I write it, do you die in the end of this or what? You know, we, we even joked about all that kind of stuff. Well, so that's how will the play of, end, yeah. Where, where um, he was, you know, it was uh, many layers of, of his personality and stuff. But to me, uh, that, that uh, sort of ending time uh, was, he seemed to be preparing for, you know, another act. <laughs> so uh, where he actually was not going to be a live actor uh, mm. or yeah. uh, anymore. So anyway, but that's the beginning. Yeah, Ma Marian, tell us a bit. Uh, uh, well, first, I just want to say congratulations to Teresa. That is like a major labor of love to spend 10 years on a book. Usually it's six or seven, but that was an amazing feat. Um, and hi, everybody. It's so nice to see you guys. It's so just, to, I mean, it's fun to hear all this stuff because there are, of course, a million things you could say on top of it. Just, I mean, I wrote a couple things down. One funny thing is... Um, 
<laughs> at the garage when he came and watched those shows, as Frank said, you know, he like stood, sat in the audience for like 17 versions of, I don't know what it was, I guess, Rums yeah. Tooth of Crime. Tooth of Crime. Crime. Yeah. He, the thing that was unnerving to all of them was this gaze that he had. It, you know, it wasn't that he was a non-actor or an actor or whatever. It was that he just sat in the audience and stared at them with these like, you know, hypnotic eyes that many people have talked about. And that's what made them so uncomfortable. I mean, in addition to wearing a suit, you know, an army uh, uniform, he looked like some kind of like maniacal figure. So I think when he... So, and they always say, like, finally, he came up one day and said, I want to be a part of this. And they were all like, oh, thank God, you know, he's not CIA or something, because it was completely <laughs> unclear what he had been doing there. Um, and, you know, another thing I think that is kind of under acknowledged is that he, I think he was actually a dramaturg in some ways. I mean, he suggested a lot of the texts that came forward in the Worcester group. So, like, he, I think he suggested Long Day's Journey in tonight and I know he suggested three sisters because he knew Paul Schmidt basically from the bars so mm -hmm. he brought Paul in and said you know let's do this Chekhov piece so that's just a little sideline but the other thing um vis-a-vis -vis what you were saying Teresa about sort of the trajectory of AIDS is that I think John's right that he Roy Cohn Jack Smith was kind of a statement about living with AIDS and Philoctetes was definitely about dying and his you know passion, I think, for John's work. And John was really about trying to harness that moment in a way that was like a final statement, much more than Roy Cohn Jack Smith. Um, that's, I think I'll stop there. Mm. Yeah, so, um, um, Teresa, um, we also now live in a way in a time of Corona, and maybe I'm thinking about it because we had this incredibly long talk, but also we live in a time, even though it's so very different, there are virus out there, even theaters are closed, so it's much more serious in the way for, um, for, for the theater companies, but for the theater community, the AIDS crisis was horrific. Um, at the time, uh, it really meant uh, social death, perhaps, you know, next also to a physical um, a physical um, death. There was, a, as you think, you wrote, there's no cure. Um, you lost your job. Um, people had to make excuses to go to funerals if they had a job because there were so many and there was no help. And um, now we have Corona. Do you see, do, do, did you think about this when you were writing, when you finished last year, the, your 10 year journey, your marathon? Well, Coronavirus wasn't a thing when I finished this book. You know, I finished it in 2019 and then mm -hmm. it took a while for it to get published. You know, it was in production. So I didn't think about it as I was writing, but certainly now in retrospect, you know, I think um, there are connections and, you know, I, I picked a segment a section to read um, about Philoctetes and about, well, I'll just, I mean, the stigmas attached to, to having AIDS, to having HIV. Uh, and, you know, I was thinking about why Ron Vader picked that particular place. So I'll, I'll just. Um, Maybe do it a bit towards the end more, you know, of, okay. um, of, of the, okay. of the cork. Yeah. Okay, but I think, you know, it was a, like coronavirus is today. I mean, I think coronavirus is a stigmatized illness, even though people are much more open. You know, I have friends on Facebook who say, oh, I have, I, I just, you know, vaccinated friends and, well, actually all, only vaccinated friends have come out and said, oh, I got COVID. Um, but I think there is a stigma attached to it. And there was, especially early on, there was a fear, um, you know, first, when I first saw the masks, I feared the masks. Now I fear people without masks in enclosed spaces. And there is this real sense that if you come down with, you know, for, for people who are in socially precarious or positions, if you come down with the virus, you could easily lose your job, you could um, miss several weeks work and lose your housing. I mean, I have, I have friends who are in that position, you know, students, uh, you could, I mean, 
you could lose a semester of school. There's so many things at stake, I think, that we, and especially for people of color and um, minorities, when you get sick, there's a tremendous amount at stake. And I think um, Ron Botter realized that. And I, I've talked with, I mean, I remember talking with, with Marianne about her activism in, in ACT UP and going with him to doctors trying to find non sort of non-traditional remedies. But I do think he understood and became angrier and, you know, maybe not angry. I don't know if angry is the right word, but more and more political uh, when he saw what was at stake for, for, for stigmatized communities with AIDS. So I think the stigma is definitely there. You know, the, the, not the same stigma, but there certainly is a, a COVID stigma. Mm. That's my sense. Can I just add, yeah. I, one thing that I found at the beginning of um, the corona crisis was that there was this kind of PTSD for people who had lived through the AIDS crisis because of the sense of bewilderment. There was just no, nobody had any idea what was going to happen. And so, you know, the, the refrigerated um, trucks, the morgues in Brooklyn, I think were really uh, pronounced in terms of like reliving that trauma. Um, you know, I mean, once it became clear that everyone was working on a vaccine, everyone globally, I think that that eased off. But at the beginning, that sense of being it, of it being helpless and tearing through the world without any, um, you know, uh, remedy was very um, reminiscent for me. Yeah. I saw a play, the first play that came back you know, it's called Blindness at the Daryl Ross Theater in Union Square. I saw that and I wrote about it for Theater Journal. I think it's coming out soon. But she she characterized, you know, she, the no, it was a male playwright, but the female protagonist, the narrator, you saw this play in utter darkness, um, it was socially distanced. But um, there was a plague of blindness, an epidemic of blindness. People began losing their vision. And I thought that this was a very interesting metaphor, both for COVID and for AIDS. Uh, she was the, the narrator was the only person who somehow miraculously, although she was sub, you know, com completely surrounded and for, you know, confined, she was confined to a, a mental hospital with her husband and other infected people, but somehow miraculously, she never became infected. She could see and she could help them. Um, and it turned out later on at the end of the play that other women could presumably see as well, that, that they had been pretending to be blind in order to help loved ones who were, who were in quarantine. Mm. And I thought, you know, this willful blindness, how, how many of us um, really are willfully and fortunately able to not see the realities of, well, I never saw the realities of the AIDS crisis. And I never really thought, it, I, no, I, that's not true. Yeah. I, I studied them academically. I didn't. But you're well there, yeah. Yeah. And then with COVID, um, blissfully, I'm, you know, Middle class academic with her own home, so I, you know, and car, so I could really avoid the ice, you know, what, you know, I could really af avoid much of what communities of color and poor people, you know, people who live in poverty, uh, who had, who were essential workers had to go through. But that play is fascinating if anyone has mm. a chance to see it. Yeah. I highly recommend it. Yeah. Um a question for John, um, in, in a way. Um, I think Roy Cohn, Roy Cohn, Jack Smith was a solo performance. He kind of left, in a way, also the Wooster Group as an ensemble. He was a great ensemble member, if I understand right, and always the team was significant to him. And uh, and he was open about the intention. I'm, I'm, I'm going to read his uh, opening monologue, not open remarks. Normally, 
especially also in post-traumatic work, you try to be obscure. You don't want to explain. You don't want to understand. You know, there shouldn't be uh, a Lehrstück, an educational play. And um, he, he broke with that. And he, in front of that, that play where he played that wild, uh, downtown, outgoing um, uh, artist, or, um, Jack Smith, who did the, you know, the, the Flaming Creatures video, and this right-wing, uh, cynical lawyer who, you know, was part of McCarthy's campaign and the model, openly the model of uh, Donald Trump. He was an advisor to him and Trump said he learned everything from him um, when it came to, 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 to court cases and legal cases um, that you have to uh, avoid and lie and not to tell the truth. Um, so he played both, and even there were two, two, two separate projects um, that then came together. Um, and he said, I'm a living, I'm a person living with AIDS. And for my own purposes, I've taken only particular aspects of their personalities and balanced one against each other. This is not a documentary, but rather a subjective reaction, a response to the lives of two very different white male homosexuals who had two powerful things in common, a virus, a society which sought to repress their homosexuality. So he explained, and it was a reaction of the theater community to, um, to, that, to that crisis. The question is, so what did it mean to you um, as a theater artist um, to have um, Ron um, taking such a statement? You mean in Roy Cohn, Jack Smith? Yeah, and in general, that he kind of dramatized, which is a history of the Wooster Group, this kind of autobiographical or self-biographical yes. work to put it on stage, mix yeah. it with found text, combined text, but also um, in a social or political, one could say, activism. And, um, and or, or what did it mean for the scene at that, at that time? Uh, well, I think it meant that he was stepping out of a lot of things. He was stepping out of the Worcester group. He was stepping out of uh, how people would um, used to view him as an ensemble member, as an actor, as this, uh, you know, guy with his beautiful eyes, you know, who would, you know, be uh, around. Uh, and he was stepping into uh, this whole other world. He was stepping into um, a, a whole other world and he was he was in a way trying to take us with him so but you know he was trying to take us with with him but in a way we were all going along with him anyway because we had to I mean it was um uh, but he was kind of uh he would say okay I'll you know I'll go into that dark room first in a way and then uh you guys can come behind me uh, so I think that's what he was he was doing to me was he was stepping into this whole another world, um, meaning, you know, uh, I'm 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 on the stage, but I'm off the stage. Uh, I'm an actor. I'm not an actor. I'm a sick person. I'm a dying person. Um, and that's who I am now. Uh, so uh, in a way, I mean, he was kind of um, uh, a brutally honest about it and um but at the same time you know i always have to say at the same time he still had a kind of a, a, a sense of humor about it all actually <laughs> um it wasn't all uh particularly a doom and gloom because i think he also could see uh other younger people behind him uh that you know were going to continue on so uh Anyway, so that's kind of, I think I have, a lot of people saw, saw him like, he was kind of a leader actually, without being a poster boy for a cause in particular. Um, so, yeah. I think Marianne has a great statement about, yeah. or a great quote about this in the book um, on page 191. So, do you want me to just read the section? If you give me a hint what it's okay. about, I could probably okay. get across. Okay, so you talked during one of our interviews, you talked about how as a lifelong Wooster Group member, Ron Botter was deeply firmly embedded in a tradition of obfuscation. Um, and you said that for him to get up there in Roy Cohn, Jack Smith, and be almost polemical, 
you know, to explain what he was doing, I think that to him was the most beautiful act. He said that. Um, and meanwhile, Schechner vividly recalled a moment during the introduction where Vader lifted his shirt and showed his AIDS-induced lesions. Uh, that's what Schechner saw, although other people say no, he never had lesions. Um, but according to Schechner, it was brave and horrific. Uh, Vader's HIV positive diagnosis had been fraught with fear and shame. By contrast, his aesthetic coming out as a performer with AIDS was a brave and liberating act. But I, I think that tradition of obfuscation that the Wooster group sort of, um, you know, has, has engaged in throughout their history this was a, a departure from that for him, uh, where he wasn't. Mm -hmm. uh, Marianne, what do you what do you what what do you think about it? I mean, can't believe I said that. Yeah, that's true. I think um, his the prologue was certainly more um, polemical, right. as Frank yeah. said, that than any Worcester Group show. But then, you know, the fact is, Jack Smith like embodied everything that you know, bore the Worcester group. So the fact that he chose this really insane, ridiculous, fabulous monologue, you know, is firmly embedded in that tradition. I mean, and, you know, as John says, I mean, it was hilarious. That's the thing about Ron, it's that it wasn't self-serious. It wasn't, you know, bemoaning his fate. It was like this celebration of the absurdity yeah. of, you know, the avant-garde in a way. Yeah. And also celebrating an artist. I saw the show in Berlin, actually. It's one of the greatest shows I've ever seen in my life. And you also could feel that he, you know, it, whatever realness means on stage, we have so much been written and thought about, you know, but you could feel it was someone and you knew it also is dying. Um, and um, why did you want to work with him? Why, why did you um, came so close to him? Well, he was extremely magnetic um, and compelling as a thinker and a performer and a person. I mean, he was exactly like he is on stage. So that kind of um, just depth and I think uh, irony and hilarity was really appealing at that time. I guess that's why, can't remember. Yeah. You know, and you, also you... I think it's like a, he was, I think, um, within the group, this kind of like stealth star. I wasn't interested in his stardom, but I think his power as a performer was like, can't be underestimated. Yeah, incredible to think that there were productions where, you know, Ron Water, um, uh, Spalding Gray, uh, Willem Dafoe were all in one place, right? Uh, put it, it together, you could see and watch them. Before the, the, he went on to the Philoctetes, you with Susan Sontag and, and Greg Martin, you, you worked on a play called Dark Dark Victory. Teresa, dig that out. Tell us a little bit, what was that about? Um, well, very briefly, so Susan also came to shows repeatedly. And so I, we saw her in the audience at Embrace Up, uh, the Three Sisters Worcester Group show, I don't know, 50 times or something. I mean, it was like insane. And she always sat in the front row. So it would be like, and now we're performing for Susan Sondag. <laughs> So she, um, I think that she approached Ron about doing something and he said, yeah, let's, you know, I want to involve Greg and Marianne for some obscure reason. And so we spent a lot of time kicking ideas around with her in her like amazing penthouse and, you know, Chelsea Towers. And we uh, settled on this Betty Davis movie, Dark Victory, which is like this completely melodramatic, again, hilarious over the top um, film about death, death and dying. So we went to the to Bellagio, John, I can't believe you were there. And which was, you know, extraordinary because um, it was a very magic mountain experience. You know, we're like nestled in the, between the Swiss and Italian Alps in this incredible palazzo and Ron was dying. So, um, you know, we would be in his room in this kind of intense bubble with Susan and Ron and Greg and just trying to unpack what was happening in that moment while purportedly trying to work on this um, script, which never came to pass. But what happened after, so Ron got sicker and sicker and we finally went to Milan and put him on the plane and then he, as Frank said, died. But 
I want to just say that um, in his, as soon as the, he touched down in New York, and I think people heard he died or in the days after, John faxed me, faxed me, um, a excerpt from Philoctetes about a little bird that was really still one of the most beautiful things I've ever read. So it was mm. an extraordinary time. Do you have that with you? No, most probably not, right? Uh, John, do you have it in your head by any chance? I, I don't have it in my head. I, I, and I, if, I listen, if I probably, if I read it, I'd probably cry. So I can't Me do too. that. But anyway, but yeah, it is. Actually, I remember that. I remember faxing you. I remember your fax back to me. I mean, these are all, you know, there's small kind of physical things, but they also kind of define all the little boundaries of the of that time period because actually everything was so uh, physical, actually, uh, mm. all the time. Yeah. Um, mm. And uh, the you know uh, somebody's presence, and then they were they were there, and then they were not there, and uh, or they were physically uh, very sick. Uh, so it was a lot of physical uh manifestations of things and i i remember all like i remember that facts and um all that kind of stuff what was it about the bird um, do you remember uh it was about a bird and the bird's body and their perception of their body uh you know it, it kind of connected to illness but not always connected to illness but that type of a thing Mm -hmm. um, so it will be interesting to think how does contemporary theater um, react on it? I don't. I haven't seen a play with someone with Corona on stage or someone who is actually most probably you know may, might not survive it. You know how, what is contemporary theater doing? How are we reacting? I mean, this it is incredible what that community at that time under miserable um, conditions what it produced. Um, um, I remember we um, once had a. a, a talk with Gaby Goddard who ran the Great Riverside uh, Studios in London. He said, you know, he was at the Berlin Ensemble. He said, I couldn't believe the miserable condition of the Berlin Ensemble they worked in, but they suffered through it to, and created something incredible, you know, with all the complexities they were in, you know, and I think um, it is a remarkable a testimony and so much um, had come together. I remember Mel Gordon, um, a friend and researcher who also died. Um, he talked about the group theater that it changed American acting. He said, um, actually American acting became different when they were on there and they had kind of a film, filmatic, cinematic acting um, that go, went away from that misunderstood Stanislavski school of the, that was never meant to be anyway. This, and he said, it actually, what we see in American films comes out of the, the, the group theater. And um, David Safran argued that um, uh, the Wooster Group and Ron Water remade acting or, or we look at experimental acting, he said, um, by not attempting to become a character, but merely by standing in for another one using Ron Water, the one who could not be present. Do, do you feel that his style or do you guys both feel or Teresa too, was that really, um, it's a big statement, um, you know, but it's, it's a consequential one, you know, do you feel it is appropriate? I mean, can I, I just need to um, jump in before I go get my yeah. report. I mean, listen, I think that that's really true because I think that Ron in particular, but even Spalding and Willem embodied this matrix acting. Yeah. Thank you, Michael the Kirby. Michael Kirby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That thing about edging closer to the real on stage was absolutely what they were doing. It was task-based. It wasn't about embodying a character. It was about doing doing it, doing it on stage. As Jack Smith used to say, if you're not doing anything, do it on stage. So Ron, and I think that this is one of the most significant things about his acting style is before every show, even a show that we had been running for three years, would get, it, before the show, um, before the audience came in, would sketch through his whole part. So he would get on stage and touch everything he was going to touch and say all the words under his breath. And it was like this incredible moment, embodied moment of sketching through something that I think also happened in the performance that he wasn't landing, settling down into a character. It was like a, almost like a visual sketch. Be right back. <laughs> yeah, John, um, was your work on theater or acting? I mean, you also have that very special, you know, I think relation to the actor, the delivery of the lines, um, 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I always felt very connected to what, what the Worcester Group was doing. But yeah, I, I always had a very cinematic approach and also an idea of, um, uh, you know, the actor would just be on the stage. They didn't have to be anyone. They only had to be uh, there. They didn't have to um, enact or represent something. It was this idea of representation, which um, to me had had been uh, exploded once I started working in television uh, way back then. I just thought, well, you know, uh, <laughs> what is all this representation of, of, of characters and what is this all supposed to mean and what are we supposed to believe about it? So, um, and I think that Ron did that very, very uh, deftly. And, um, but I think it's probably how we looked at reality in a way, you know, um, and even sometimes you couldn't tell if he was, <laughs> you know, he was just getting through a, a situation somehow. Acting, mm -hmm. maybe not acting, but just uh, being through a situation. There's different ways to be. And I think for an actor, that's a very important thing to, to learn. There's different ways to be. You, you just can't um, learn, uh, learn something and then just keep repeating it. That's really mm -hmm. not being actually, that's kind of repeating, but um, anyway, mm -hmm. so yeah, I think he, 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 and I think a lot of people have adopted, I mean, you see it everywhere. There's just a lot of people have adopted what, what Ron, uh, you see, the, the, oddly, they've learned how to mimic it or something in a way. And it mm -hmm. doesn't, it doesn't come off. It's not the same thing, actually. It's so, not the same thing, yeah. But it's it has different. had its, infl its influence has mm -hmm. been very, very good. Yeah, so. yeah. And then he had that role in the Philadelphia movie where yes. Ace for the first time actually got dramatized on a major movie screen. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and um, so that was um, quite something. It moved over. I know also your Steve Buscemi, who was a company member when he started out, you know, learned his basic acting, well, you, which he knows. also took over. Steve yeah. actually did play the first, well, uh -huh. the first in Parting Glance is the first uh, person with AIDS on screen actually uh, oh. I think before Philadelphia yeah before actually yeah. before you know this is uh, interesting and you know I, the time the timeline of all this with uh, living downtown you know it was all in a, in a timeline so uh, by the time Steve did um parting glances was 86 or 87 something like that already mm -hmm. um the Philadelphia story didn't come till later so this was a uh, a, a slowly approaching tidal wave. And by the time actually that Ron did Roy Cohn, Jack Smith, the tidal wave was just about to completely crash on, completely crash on everybody actually Com in, a, in a major way. It had been building and building and building. And by the time 94 came around, that was um, a huge, uh, huge thing. So he kind of left it an interesting point. I thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's incredible. And but what stories will tell people uh, in 20, 30 years from now about New York theater and Corona? I wonder what's out there. You know, I'm looking, we are looking. Yeah, I don't... The theaters are closed also, but um, what is the reaction really? What will be significant? You know, maybe at the time it was also not so clear that this would be, you know, the place that crystallized um, everything. Teresa, you wrote the book and, and we want to listen to you too. When you did all the research of 10 years, what surprised you? What did you find? What do you say? I didn't expect that. Well, I didn't expect that he had a past in college. First of all, I did not expect that he had been an actor in college at all. I, I sort of thought he was an army recruiter, like he said he was, and he was that. Which is actually, you were right in the book, it's not really true. Nobody really knows you. You even looked at his apartment where he lived and say, did he really walk by there? Was he a recruiter? No, it's well, not really clear. Was there even a recruiting office? You know, it was well, a story, you, you're right. He also liked to make up stories. Just, you also mentioned it, the idea, it's still a bit post Vietnam War era that a guy wants to be part of the most experimental underground group in New York City or perhaps in the world at the time and he shows up in his army uniform it's just well, incredible in itself but uh, I actually uh, looked up his army record I got yeah. you know through the Freedom of Information Act I most of it was some of it was redacted but he did work you know his, one of his last 
projects was in New York City for two weeks, I think, in nineteen seven, the winter of 1972. Yeah. And I think he might have stayed. You know, I think he he stayed here and with the goal, honestly, of becoming an, an experimental theater actor. That yeah, that's your doing. line, which is a big discovery. So he actually, he came here and wanted to work in right. the downtown experimental theater. Right. And I think Spalding Gray said, you know, during my interview with Spalding Gray, which was the day before he disappeared, before Spalding Gray committed suicide, um, he said that Ron became a character in the production as much as anybody on stage. And I asked what kind of a character was he? And he said, well, you know, the kind of character he was, a guy dressed in an army recruiter, you know, uniform. And so he was himself. And he was a character. And I think that was the starting point of Spalding's fascination with him, that somebody could be themselves and also be playing a character. And, Sp and he and Spalding did a piece called Interviewing the Audience, where they would interview people about what they had been doing before the show. Yeah, how oh, they got and to the show, right? Yeah. That, that was they, the show. They would put people on stage saying, how did you get here? And yeah, what, yeah. Is, what were you thinking? Yeah, and um, Spalding Gray took that on the road. You know, Ron Vladder didn't go with him, but Spalding Gray later created a piece, I think it was called Interviewing the Audience. So I didn't expect that he had a past, actually, in theater until I met um, this guy who had, you know, but the Booster Group's archivist had put me in touch with a guy who was the brother of his friend who had gone to college with Ron. You know, the brother had gone to college with Ron. He had been in, the, in this Franciscan program. And suddenly the student who had been in this Franciscan program put me in touch with all these other young, well, men who had been in that program, in the Franciscan program, which brought, Ron Vader was briefly a part of, and who had also been in the theater club. And I met their director, you know, the a much older, mm -hmm professor so that i didn't expect i didn't expect that he had such a compartmentalized life you know i could tell in talking to his mom that she you know she told me how hard it was for her to take in the fact that she learned her son was gay and that he had aids on the same day she had no idea i mean and she didn't know until he was hospitalized until he had that seizure you know, to have that kind of a compartmentalized life where you have so many different, you know, sides of yourself and people, know, you know, and to be able to hold that, sustain that for so many years with his family versus his Wooster group friends, you know, uh, that was surprising to me. I didn't know how hard he worked um, on these shows when he was dying and what it took to stop being a stand-in, you know, because the Wooster Group aesthetic was that you stand in for other people who aren't there. You can stand in, you know, he stood in for Spalding Gray's mother. Uh, he stood in Rumsey for, Gold, yeah. yeah, I mean, he started, he developed that whole aesthetic and he spoke of himself in David Saverin's book as this kind of a surrogate or stand in, and he said, anyone could be there, anyone could be standing in, it just happens to be me. Um, and he stood in for Spalding Gray's father so well that Spalding thought, you know, you could hear his, the, the, the breath, the way his father had breathed, the intonations of that breathing. Um, to, to, to go from there to finally standing you know, to standing beside these men who are dying, not standing in for them, but, you know, saying I am one of them and this is me. And, you know, I didn't know. I really, there's so much I didn't know. And when I started this book, I didn't know anything about death. I had never lost anybody. I had never lost somebody close to me. And as I wrote it, um, my parents both died. No, my, my dad died in 2004. My husband died in 2012. 
um, you know, uh, there's a lot of loss. My daughter was born, which was wonderful, but I didn't really understand. I think when I talked to people about losing Ron at that time, what loss meant, you know, I didn't know what, how Marianne had felt or how John had felt or how Greg had felt or the Wooster group themselves, how they, you know, the, you know, this real loss of this person that you loved and spent a, a lifetime with or years with. I didn't understand that on a yeah, Greg real Martin, level. Who was for 14 years his partner, you know, and um, up until um, his death, who um, survived, I think, also that, that, that crisis. Yeah, it's... Um, it is incredible. Also, you spoke about his early days at Siena College. I think one of his roommates became a car, arts, uh, archbishop, another one a two-star general. Yeah, in yeah. Puerto, of Puerto Rico, the other, the other was a two-star general and the commander of the New York State uh, um, um, Army Corps or whatever, something. I mean, that these were his, um, his friends. Yeah, it is incredible. I think Richard Schechner's work, which is really this brilliant work he did with the uh, performance group, and that actually gave birth you know, to the Wooster group, he actually, which I didn't know that Wooster group is how he called his place where he bought the shares to own it was called Wooster group because it was on Wooster um, Street, Street if, if I understand right. And he actually, as you point out, he handed over the shares in a, almost like an ancient Greek tragedy in a defeat of the general who had to give it over to the new one and uh, who couldn't see a work to, to next to each other on both sides, um, uh, complicated. And I wish they had found a way um, um, to do that also from the Wooster group. Um, mm. But um, yeah, that Schechner said, you know, you use life, life material. I think he would interview the per private lives, sexual lives, uh, emotional lives of people, but he would never be part of the what the audience experienced. It was in the play, but never visible. And the Wooster group kind of, you know, turned that around and made it out invisible as an enormous change, an enormous contribution um, um, that came um, came out of it. But now let's talk. I really would like to talk, and we have both of them here with us, and I hope you will forgive us, um, Teresa. You, you, people, you really look at the book. It's a remarkable life and detailed study um, of, of an actor, of a New York actor, stuff we all would love secretly to be. Um, you know, that was his life, and um, and she researched it and what he did, and for also it's lots to learn about, you know, work with friends, go for what you want, stay, don't go away, go 20 times, say you know, um, choose a place and be with it. But um, when we now come to um, that, that, that uh, Philoctetes um, uh, uh, work, um, which um, as Marian earlier said so beautifully, um, Ray Cohn, Jack Smith was about living with AIDS. And then this was about dying with AIDS or with a virus or with the disease, or as Arthur would say, with the plague. Um, so how <clears throat> how did it all um, how did that start and how did that came about? Well, well what was the, what was the original know, I, idea? Why did he say that? A Greek well, uh, tragedy. Um, he just to also to give you a little scenario, sense of place and time. Um, this was must have been on ninety, uh, probably ninety two sometime, and. Um, I used to do these street fairs and sell junk on the street, uh, all kinds of things. And he was looking for old lamps and stuff. And so he saw some stuff, some junk on my table. He said, oh, I actually, John, I, I, you know, this is for uh, Roy Cohn, John Jackson. You know, I, I need this kind of junk stuff. And I said, oh, just, you know, uh, take it, uh, take it. But, you know, you know, it's just junk anyway. Um, and that, and at that table is when he said, you know, I would, I would really love to work with you, and let's talk about uh, a Greek play. I was like, oh, what the fuck? What are you talking about? <laughs> a Greek play? That was the last thing I, I would have been interested in doing, actually. So, anyways, that's it. But it started at that table there, and then, th then it went on, and then we, you know, he told me about uh, the story, and I vaguely remembered it from from college. And then he just said, just, um, I want Maybe to you want to talk to this, tell the story just in a few sentences for all audiences. Oh, Philoctetes, oh God. Okay, uh, Trojan War, uh, Philoctetes is a, a Greek general. Um, he's with Odysseus. They're going on their way to, to, uh, to, to actually they, it's, they've been fighting the war for like 10 years. 
they can't win um and uh they need uh these magic arrows to to win the trojan war but meanwhile on their way to the trojan war 10 years before they left philoctetes behind on an island because he'd been bitten by a snake and he was in such uh he was such a mess actually that they just abandoned him they left him there and, and then he they, smelled yeah and stank, yeah, smelled everything yeah. and then they they can't win after 10 years the the oracle says um you need these magic arrows and Philoctetes has the arrows. Great. So they have to go back and pick up the arrows. So that's basically what happens. And then um, Odysseus brings um, uh, Neoptolemus, who is the uh, uh, son of, a, of Achilles, I think. <laughs> it's been mm -hmm. so long. But, um, anyway, so he, he brings him there. And then there's basically this, this argument, uh, apparently, about the arrows. But... It is really about um, life and death and, and all this other, other stuff, uh, transitioning from a, one reality to another. So it gets into a lot of other things, but it starts with this um, sort of thorny situation uh, that also has to do with war and killing and death and violence and all, all that kind of stuff. Right. So that's, that's kind of um, uh, where 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 it started and then and ron basically said just you know you should just write what you want and then there was this idea to combine it with um uh, some heiner muller text and andre g text and make this um kind of experimental version of philoctetes made out of all these different pieces so they wanted me to write the the uh American part of it, I guess. So that's kind of how it started. But then the more we worked on it, um, Ron really, you know, he really liked it the way it was, but he was, you know, he had, he was tied up into this, um, it was Kai, Kai Theater, right? Yeah, uh, Brussels. Yeah, it was Kai Theater. And so they had this whole production with, uh, I think Anna Teresa to was supposed to be doing the dancing. Leslie Thornton was supposed to be doing the video. It was this huge, crazy thing uh, by with this director, Jan Rietzma. But um, it slowly, and Marianne probably knows much better than me, but I mean, it slowly devolved into a, um, um, a uh, not a reality show, but in a way he, he was actually dying during the, the piece. Uh, so that's how how uh, it started. But I, I do think he he was kind of conflicted by the way that um, the apparent show was supposed to go and the way his life was going. And I remember they <laughs> I've never told anybody this before. They the Kai Theater told us uh, send us all this at the beginning. They sent a huge box of um, uh, research materials on Greek plays, on this version and that version, and all this kind of stuff. And we're sitting there looking at it, going, "What? We don't." Ron didn't care about it. I, I said, "What am I going to do with all this? Am I supposed to write something?" He said, "No, no, no, no. Let's throw it away." So we threw it away uh, at a garbage can on the corner of Seventh Avenue and and Bleecker Street. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that was in a way. So Ron, in a way, I said, yeah, shall we just, he said, yeah, let's just throw it away. I, I don't want it. Yeah, it's like uh, Walter Kropius, who was well, teaching ar architecture at Harvard. Was saying, <laughs> throw out all the architecture books, which he did. Exactly. I just well, want to have Bauhaus books on the shelf. Yes, yes. yes, it's true, because he said, you know, we have, we're doing our own, this is our own philosophies. We're starting from ground zero. We, we, this is what we're doing now. So don't, and so in a way that was very, uh, to me, it was, as a playwright, it was, it was gave me a lot of courage. Okay, I'm just going to write whatever I want. And that's what he wants. He wants the words. He's going to do the acting. Uh, and this is, to me, it's a kind of a very, it's a great example of a writer and an actor getting together um, and then making something together out, out of that rather than um, some other uh, things that are at work. Mm, yeah, um, incredible. And, and he was already- people don't like actors to be together with writers too much. They, yeah. <laughs> they That's don't. True. 
uh, because yeah. it can be uh, it could be great, but it could be a lethal thumb. But this was good. So I, I mean, it was you know him talking to me and me talking to him and me giving the words to him directly to the actor, not through mm. anybody else. Um, yeah. So As people would say today, a non-hierarchical well, uh, but, uh, yeah. uh, relation and yeah. um, kind of, yeah. it, and to know that you know if if I understand right, Ron was already too sick to perform in the Saint, uh, the Temptation of Saint Anthony. He couldn't finish it. I think um, Willem Dafoe took over, if I'm right, um, for for some of the shows. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think uh, um, Norm Frisch ta talked about. I think uh, the talk to this. He said uh, Ron would lay in a casket at center stage. And I think he really wanted to die on stage during the run of that show. I think that would have been his wish, not to die in a hospital, not to die in an airplane, but um, on stage. But, you know, as you, in the play, it's kind of opened. It doesn't really, man doesn't really know how it ends. It was, mm. was, was open. Marianne, what, you were part of that, right? And yeah. um, I was, and what, I, I'll just amend the end by saying um, two things. I think Willem played it after Ron died, when they had after a, Ron died. a restaging of it somewhere in Europe, I guess. Yeah. In so um, the one thing that I do remember, as long as we're drilling down into the details, is that Susan and I had arrived in Bellagio and we were waiting for Ron and Greg. And there was this whole thing, like, was Ron too sick to travel? You know, had he actually been rehearsing? And the whole thing at Kai was, you know, as John said, they had this elaborate, you know, in, uh, support structure. All, everyone was there, dramaturg, blah, blah, blah. And he hardly ever rehearsed. He hardly got on stage because he was so sick. But that whole question of, you know, I think he was already in this gray netherworld before he came to Bellagio. Like getting on the train with Greg, I think was excruciating. And that whole journey and then landing in Italy and then leaving again, you know, was all this, these stages of kind of losing consciousness or letting go. Yeah. And in a way, you know, what, I mean, as you know, also Carol Martin talked, you know, about the, 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 um, the theater of the real, you know, um, so the so traumatization of death with someone who, who is dying. I think there's a remark from Heiner Miller who said, Everybody talks about the liveness and life uh, on stage, you know, which is actually true. I think in a theater audience and actors age at the same time, it's not a film. You are there, they get older, you get older, you know. But Hannah Muller said, what's important is that actually the audience member, they could die. That's what's important. And you're showing them something. And, um, and, um, and I think that in a way, you know, that, that, that was, um, 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 so present a dramatization of, of death and the reality of it and not perhaps as, you know, removed from us as in the Corona time, um, in the Corona time now. Did you, did you ever feel, um, um, I think there is a quote about John, I think Teresa, I think that it's a freak show, uh, you know, a dying performer with age on stage, people pay to see him. It's, uh, you know, there's supposedly there are legends of, German immigrants who went to suicide bar where um, people would pay seeing them dying, drinking themselves to death with poison, but then they would take over the, the um, you know, the depth of, and save the family, but the people had to die in front of their eyes. Um, it, there is the story, you know, in, in Italy, in Palermo, I think it is still, there's the idea of the sin eater, like someone dies and they put a piece of bread on the deceased and they think all the sins go in and then they pay a poor person to eat the bread. And then, you know, it goes with that, you know, um, in a way, you know, was it, I had to think of it. I don't know what the connections of him in his casket, you know, all that, what was so wrong in society and he took it on and he uh, put it in. But do you feel there was something uncanny about it or do you feel no, that was right? This is the way it should have been done. Is that a question for me? Uh, first for Marianne and then Teresa. Oh, Lord, you mean uncanny about his death? Would to show him there, the out stage, there, so the open. Stage, the stage production is that, you know, it. is that, a, was that freakish in a way? But I think that was the quote. Oh, good. Well, I mean, haha. I think that when we were touring Europe with Roy Cohn Jack Smith, there was that kind of homophobia that was not in New York. 
So that whole, I mean, a freak show is like, you know, fuck you. That's my feeling about it. But um, mm-hmm. I do think that he was used to sort of frame, putting frames around his life. So that was just another frame. A frame in a sense of? Around his dying. The Philoctetes became like a frame around his death. Yeah. You know what I mean, Frank? A frame for him to walk it through, to experience it? Yeah, or just to show it to the world. Mm-hmm. Not to, to hide share it. Share it. Yeah. To embody it. To embody it, yeah. Teresa, what do you think? Well, I'll read you the quotes, you know, um, that you're referencing here. Uh, and Vodder's trusted European collabor- collaborators, Kai Cedar and director Jan Ritz- Ritzma, honored the way in which the actor chose to present himself on stage. By contrast, the image of a person with late stage AIDS speaking from the inside of a coffin provoked anxiety amongst some of Vodder's American peers. Jesserin recalled his discomfort, discomfort with the circumstances under which the show went on. And this is John here. Ron got very sick on the second evening. He was literally in a kind of delirium. And if anybody sees tapes of those performances, they're horrifying. This is where I found there was, as far as AIDS was concerned, a split between Europe and America. I personally thought that this director and theater were putting on a freak show. And then I say, you know, my my converse argument, I always have to be like the devil's advocate. Conversely, one might argue that Ritzma, Ritzima and the Kai Theater were incredibly brave to present the realities of late stage AIDS, usually hidden in private rooms and hospices. The March 3rd, 1994 premiere was Butter's only full performance of Philoctetes. Due to his failing health, Kai Theater canceled the rest of the run. Prior to that time, Vader had never missed a performance with the Wooster Group or of Ron, Roy Cohn, Jack Smith. Jesserin noted that Vader sometimes did readings of Philoctetes in the United States. The readings I heard Vader, the readings I heard Ron do were amazing and very quiet. John said, "For Ron, it was a quiet time. If he couldn't act it, then at least he could say it. That was really important for him, you know." And so. Um, you know, in another section, just briefly, Ron was talking with, he did an interview with a, um, a Flemish, I'm trying to, uh, Frank Verkruis, I can't say his last name, Frank Verkruisen from Stan, a company, a Flemish company called Stan. It was called The Dialogue and Acting. And near the end of that transcript, while discussing an unnamed performance, which could have been Roy Cohn, Jack Smith, or could have been Philoctetes, um, he confided, Ron confided to Verkrusen, that his mode of engaging with audiences was changing as a direct result of, of his AIDS. And this is his quote. I had this extraordinary experience this week. For the first time in my life, because of my health, I had to cancel two shows. I had respiratory complications. So we decided in the next two in the next performances to turn the whole thing into a kind of documentary. I had to talk to the audience and try to join the audience a couple of times. I'm not sure that what I do now is even theater. It's more social. It's trying to wake people up a bit. This, as he had done throughout his career, Vader adapted to change. This time, however, the transitions to which he responded were not those of an ensemble or its leaders. The changes were in his body. Long known for his readiness to take risks, Vader now faced a profoundly poignant gamble, sharing his daily efforts to live and work with viewers who paid to see theater. So people were paying to see theater and he was showing them his life. Um, and so, you know, my thoughts on this are, I guess that it was good for people to see that. I mean, I think it was necessary and powerful. And I hope there'll be a time when people can talk about coronavirus that way openly and what what it's like to to live with this virus and to have long COVID and to lose people. Because I think it's still, you know, not 
not something that theater wants to represent right now. It's too close to home. Hmm. Yeah, and it took incredible strength, I think. It was almost like a gladiator or a, you know, or a soldier or what he was, you know, to to share that be there and uh, and um and to be out there. It is um quite um quite a great testimony, I think, also of this generation of theater makers, um, how to deal with life, how to create meaning, um, how to give things and share and also help society to deal and think about um um, um issues, problems, complications, life-threatening things that are happening. And I think this is why theater is so important. And we will only know perhaps five, 10 years from now what will happen in that moment where we are in a, most probably it is as serious, you know, as the AIDS crisis, if not more. So theater has to react, will change, and we will have to see um, what it was. But I think he um, really um, um, is, a, is a model of a, of a engaged theater artist, you know, who in his time, you know, used the means available based on his tradition to invent something and to do something new that touched so many lives became so significant. Incredible to think, John, that it was only performed once then, one evening. Well, apparently from, from what I know, right? Yeah, it was, uh, well, if you want to call it a performance, it was- What it was, was it? Like once. I guess it was like a run through, you think, or no, no, I mean, it was just lived. You don't, it's not even, doesn't even go in in that category. What do you that, mean? Which is what we're talking about. Yeah. He yeah, you know, I mean, showed I don't up know. at the theater and I, whatever happened, happened. And, and that's what it was. I mean, uh, yeah. Uh, but anyway, yeah, I, I, and you, uh, yeah, it was, I think that was it. That was it. They were done, you know, in a way he made it to kind of to the finish line, mm -hmm. apparently, in, in a certain way. But, um, but, you know, in a way it was not, he, you know, he knew, whatever we talked, he said, he said, it may not be for me to um, say these words, you know, mm -hmm. that, you know, they, um, whatever. Like a Moses who shows, shows the me, promise. But, um, I'm not, I may not be able to enter. I mean, in a way he, 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 he wasn't able, so they had to be, you know, pushed forward to the next thing. You know, that was his part in it. His part of it in it actually was not being the acting actor, the present actor. I mean, he was the um, delivery mechanism <laughs> to for, for the words to get to another actor. So that's kind of a very, in a way, a, a very interesting, generous type of it. And that saying, you know, you're going to have to take this script because I, you know, it's mine, but I can't do it. So, uh, but that, that's kind of a, how I see it. He just made it to the finish line. And um, uh, so. Well, you both made it. I think there's another, you know, years ago, you, John, I don't think you, you may not remember this, but in 2002, you did a symposium with me at NYU where you spoke. That's where I first met you. It was you and Richard and Karen Finley. And um, you said that he asked, you tentatively asked Fodder if making Philoctetes would be too much for him. You said um, Ron was walking around very gingerly. He was turning into a wisp. I got very nervous and worried. I said to him, are you going to be able to finish this thing? He said, you know, we may not be able to finish this thing. This may be you walking me to the gate here. And I think to him, <laughs> mm -hmm. and I think he, you know, to him, it didn't matter in a way if he finished it or not. The fact that you, he had someone to walk him to the gate was yeah. important. The fact mm -hmm. that he had a role to play, right. you know, kept yeah. him alive. Yeah. So. Marianne, yeah. we interrupted you. You had. Oh, just that I think the reports of that that perform that final performance were, you know, that it, it was labored. He was having trouble breathing. I don't think he made it through the whole script. I think it was uh, kind of a half representation of the actual um, yeah. you know, text. Yeah. But I, you know, I also have to say just, um, uh, you know, I was not at that performance, but I was in, Europe 
during a lot of that time of that very bad AIDS time. And, you know, uh, to Europe at that point, at least as a, a gay guy there, I felt that we were American gays, whatever, were a freak show for Europe. It was like, Oh, you know that's not that's not going to happen here. You just guys, you guys, just, you know, couldn't control you. Whatever, you know, all that kind of stuff. It was very, it was pretty uh, brutal, and that's why I reacted so much against that performance. I just, you know, they're just, um, they're not looking at him as them. They're looking at him as uh, the other, the, you know, the Americans or whatever, mm -hmm. or the gays or whatever. It's them they're looking at. They're not looking at, at uh, him as, you know, a, a fellow human being. And that's kind of what was part of, you know, it was part of that idea of the play. It was part of a lot of what was going on with um, in theater and, and AIDS and all that kind of stuff. There was that split at that point and it was, um, it was, it was cre very creepy, I, I thought. Um, mm. Uh, and people would kind of treat you in this way. Well, you know, um, you're one of them, or, or we feel so sorry for you, or uh, we want to help you, and uh, all this. Kind of, it was it was pretty weird, I have to say. Mm. So I don't know. Mm. Uh, I just thought I'd throw that in, but uh, yeah, they they just needed him, uh, like Phil to to win well, the war you know, to make good theater, it, right? Yeah, turn into a theater play. What is, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, uh, when meanwhile people were actually really, um, you know, really dying. Yeah. It. Well, yeah. So, what do you do? Yeah. What does art mean really in the face of someone no. dying? And if he, someone is dying in stage, on stage yeah. in front of you, and that's incredible. Also incredible that the story, you know, in a way that uh, theater perhaps was that island for Ron, you know, where he mm. went away from life. You know, he said, "I'm not going to join the wars of life." You know, he had been. Um, shot anyway and he was suffering but the theater his there was his island and then the world comes back to him and says you know we want to see you you know and um, so it's just so many layers um, to that um, to, to that story of um, of uh, this I think Jack Smith had a show called Rented Island I think it was the uh, right. the theme of uh, the Whitney exhibition that kind of theater it's an interesting idea of a rented island it's not you're on, you're on an island and it's your rented, it's not yours. And um, and what do you do? Do you engage? Do you not? This Hamlet question in a way, what, what he was wrestling with. So there's so many layers to it and so many truths to it. And, and so I really want to thank you all for, for um, you know, giving us a little bit more of an idea of that time. And it's really worth reading the history and the story of Ron. And it's so connected to the Wooster Group, the Richards work, um, um, the performance group, to New York City and to theater in general, how theater morphed, you know, how it changed, you know, from a repertoire written plays by British playwrights, you know, to uh, the classics, to, to something contemporary, this incredible work of that company. And so really thank you, Teresa, for spending so much time with it. So much is written at the moment also in academia and I'm all for it about theory, it's important, you know, and, um, and at the long time, it was not at the forefront, but now I think the stories of the performers, the directors, the places, the companies are missing and they need to be recorded so we understand better where we come from. And um, because at the time they helped us to deal with the moment, but also with the future and uh, that that was coming. So really, thank you all. We could stay a much, much longer. I don't know, Teresa, do you still have a, uh, something for us to read or you... Uh, you already read the part um, you had prepared, right? Um, I don't know. I think maybe... Um, maybe some of his words, if there is something... Uh... Well, there's this very moody, moving section by... Um, you know, there's two sections. Well, let's take one and as, okay. a, as a final word and, and we this listen is, to you. Yeah. Okay. So this is. Uh, uh, I'll read the facts from Mary. Well, yeah. not, okay. So the Wooster Group's archives 
include condolences sent to the company after Vater's death. Among the cards and letters there, one message stood out. It was a fax from Marianne Weems, still in Bellagio, writing to express her grief at Vater's passing and to recount his final days there, and to recount his final days. In her fax, Weems recalled how urgently Vater had wanted to go home. Slipping between clarity and dementia, he said calmly, I think it might be time to retire. At the hospital in Milan, as medical staff prepared him to board the plane for New York, Weems whispered Ronnie and stroked his forehead. Vater briefly opened his eyes. At last on the tarmac, he finally seemed relieved. Knowing all along how Vater's story ends, there is little comfort and closure. In reflecting on what I have learned about Vater in the years since I first began this project, I would say, ironically, that some of my own claims about Vater are the ones he might reject. Though I provide strong evidence throughout this book for Vater's role as an unsung hero of both the performance group and the Wooster group, he would surely resist taking credit away from his collaborators, particularly Schechner and Lecomte. Vater would not call himself a shadow governor, though, even though he played an influential administrative role in both companies. Instead of seeking to stand out, I suspect Vater would take the greatest pride in being known as a team player, someone who did his part and who wore his multiple hats very well. Yeah, wonderful. Really, really thank you. And that's a, a good conclusion. And um, I remember also that one line you quoted that he used to say to his girlfriends and boyfriends, honey, longevity is not in the cards. And um, and that's how it is. That was in his life. But that's also theater. You know, it's, it disappears, you know. And um, so really, thank you all for joining, for taking the time, Teresa, for writing and Marianne and John for being such good friends to him, being part of his creative work, helping him also to, to, to be there present um, on stage. And uh, thanks for us, for HowlRound, uh, uh, Thea and VJ for, for putting up our, for putting up with us for so many months now and, uh, and to host our book series, which I think is important to listen to what people wrote and thought about in this time of Corona. We're going to have actually Alexis Green uh, on Wednesday and she will talk to Emily Mann, the remarkable story of Emily Mann as a woman uh, that had to find her way through the American uh, theater system and, um, and been running for 30 years, the Mercator in Princeton, but all the complications, I was not aware of it. And it's an, also an incredibly meticulous research um, and record of her work and life. Um, I can't wait to, to do that, but really um, thank you. And thank you for our audience. Um, it means a lot for us that you listen. There's so much out there. When we started our Siegel Talks, there were not so many conversations. Now there's an abundance of it. I think it's great, but uh, I think also um, we show our respect to writers of books and uh, who put these things together. And we learn something also um, about us and maybe there's something inside inside it that could change our lives as it was for these artists who read something and said, this is important and we have to take it and transform it and we can do the very same. So John, Marianne, and Teresa, thank you so much. Thanks to my CEQA team. Uh, Great to see Gora, you, Marianne. Thank yeah, you. Cactus Juice, uh, Tandy, right Andy, and um, see you all soon. And, um, and uh, what time is it in San Francisco now? Well, it's time to <laughs> teach, so. Time to teach. Okay. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you, Frank. Bye-bye.